الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah he says in the last chapter of his book his groundbreaking book the book that changed the history of humanity by Allah's permission not the history of Islam but of humanity I don't know how many books have been written in the way and in the manner and in the style that Imam al-Bukhari was allowed to write his book he says in this uh, magnificent amazing work باب قول الله تعالى ونضع الموازين القسط ليوم القيامة وأن أعمال بني آدم وقولهم يزن وقال مجاهد القسطاس العدل بالرومية ويقال القسط مصدر المقسط وهو العدل وأما القاسط فهو الجائر حدثنا أحمد بن إشكاب قال حدثنا محمد بن فضيل عن عمارة بن القعقع عن أبي زرعة عن ابي هريره رضي الله عنه قال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وسلم كلمتان حبيبتان الى الرحمن خفيفتان على اللسان ثقيلتان في الميزان سبحان الله وبحمده سبحان الله العظيم امام البخاري he has in his last book his last chapter kitab at-tawhid the book of the oneness of allah azza wa jal and his uniqueness the book of Allah's splendid and lofty attributes, and that He has them with no one else, no partner. Of Allah's beautiful names and perfect attributes, and Allah's actions. Kitab at tawheed that's what He means by at tawheed And the last chapter of this book, of this kitab, He says that Allah the Exalted tells us, He quotes an ayah from the Quran, Allah says, وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ He says, and on the day of judgment, we shall establish the scales of justice. On the day of judgment, Allah says, we shall establish the scales of judgment. Or the scales of justice, excuse me. Before we move forward, this shows us is that Imam al-Bukhari's book is not just a book of hadith. It's not just a book of hadith, but it's also a book of tafsir. It is also a major contribution to the science and field of the tafsir of the Qur'an al kareem So he quotes the verse from the Qur'an al azim Allah says, and on that day, وَنَضَعُوا He says, and we will place the scales of qist, of justice, on the day of judgment. On that day, there will be ultimate justice. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he then goes on to explain and expound on the fact that the deeds and the statements... <coughs> of the children of Adam will be weighed, will be placed, in, or they will be weighed, they will be wazen, they will actually be weighed. Moving to the point in which we want to focus on this morning, the last hadith here in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, he says, Rahimahullah ta'ala, Hadathna Ahmad ibn Ishkab, his sheikh, his teacher, Ahmad ibn Ishkab, reported to us, Imam al-Bukhari is saying, Ahmad ibn Ishkab, his teacher, said that he told us, that a man whose name was Muhammad ibn Fudail related to them as well. Muhammad ibn Fudail from another narrator whose name is Umara ibn al Qaqa, who reported from Abu Zura, who reported from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This is the Isnad, the chain of report. Ahmad ibn Ishkab, Muhammad ibn Fudail, Umara ibn al Qaqa, then we have Abu Zura, and now we have the companion, Abu Hurairah. This is a list of reporters, of narrators. And Abu Huraira, he reported that the Prophet ﷺ said the following words. Kalimatani habibatani ila rahman He said that there are two statements, two phrases, which are habibatani ila rahman beloved and loved by Allah al-Rahman, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two sayings, two statements, they are beloved. Allah Ar-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, is very fond of these two statements. Khafifatani ala lisan. And despite the fact that they're beloved to Allah, they're khafif, light upon the tongue, easily, simply said and uttered. He then says, Thaqilatani fil mizan. And they're also heavy in these scales. 
heavy in the scales. Yani, of your good deeds. They're heavy, weighty, and mighty in your scales. What are these two statements? The Prophet Sallallahu he tells us, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, to say Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. To say Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah, how perfect is Allah? How perfect is Allah? Beyond all imperfections, wa bihamdihi. And with his praise, subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah al azim And how perfect is Allah who is al azim the most, or the one who has the ultimate might and absolute power, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us once more, kalimatan, he says two statements, two phrases, two small basic sentences have the following qualities. Number one, Habibatani ila Rahman. They are beloved to Ar-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves when someone makes these statements. And He will love those who make those statements. And if Allah loves you and loves your statements, what do you have to worry about? Who are you going to fear? Who are you going to hope for and look for and long for and yearn for if Allah Azza wa Jal loves you? The Prophet ﷺ, he says, even though these statements are beloved to Ar-Rahman, you're now thinking that they have to be long, strenuous, burdensome, very costly. Naam? Something that you have to be a master to, to, to get, a master of knowledge, to understand and to get this great reward, this great virtue. No, that's not the case. You can't lose on whatever level you may be on. You can't lose if you're with the Sunnah of the Prophet. There's no way that you're going to lose. He says, these two statements are beloved to Ar-Rahman subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there's something else. The Prophet, he tells us, خَفِيفَتَانِ عَلَى lisan." He says, they are light upon the tongue. Light upon the tongue. Easily said, easily uttered, easily spoken. Who can't say that? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah al No matter what language you have. No matter what accent you have. No matter what is your original mother tongue. No matter how much knowledge you do or don't have, everyone can make that statement. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al azim. He says, and these statements are easy upon the tongue, thaqilatani fil mizan. And they are heavy in one scale of good deeds. So let's stop and dissect this and break this down. First and foremost, the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he encouraged us. He encouraged us. He gave us something which was a means of waking us up and opening our eyes and giving us to have the desire for what he's going to say. He didn't just say, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al-Azim, Habibatani ila rahman khafifatani ala lisan thaqilatani fil mizan. Rather, he said, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is. Finally, then he made the statement. I got something for you, Sheikh Mahdi. You're going to like it. It's nice, it's special, it's antique, it's this and it's that, and so on and so on and so forth. It's easy to carry, it's expensive, it's nice, and it's authentic. Okay, wow, what is it? I got a nice pocket watch for you. That's not the same as me saying I have an antique pocket watch for you. It's antique, it's nice, it's light, it's this and it's that and it's that. You understand? I get you what? Interested first. I have something for you that's very, very special. A special. It's special to me. At the same time, it's easy for you to carry around. And at the same time, it's authentic. It's precious. Then I tell you, I have the what? The pocket watch. That's not the same as me saying I have a pocket watch for you that is precious to me, that is simple and easy, and that is authentic. It's not what? It's not the same. So the Prophet said, he encouraged us first. And then he did what? Told us what it is. Everybody understand this? So this is one of these styles of teaching. It's to encourage the people, to get them excited. So to get them hype. Like an advertisement. A trailer. Showing you what's going to be presented in the program. But not giving you the entire what? Program. Whatever that program may be. Everybody understand this? So this is how the Prophet ﷺ wished to teach his followers. Now, stop and reflect and think about this hadith. How is the hadith, or how are these two statements, light upon the tongue, yet heavy in the scales? Light on the tongue, 
but heavy in the scales. In other words, how can a statement be light and heavy? Speaking physically and metaphysically, metaphorically, literally, etc. But not even that. Just the concept of the value of something that's sturdy, but at the same time, it's what? It's light. I understand this. You start talking about metal, such as gold. It's relatively light when you compare it to other metals, but at the same time, it can hold its form, its mold. That's why people prefer gold teeth and things like this. And there are other reasons as well. But the, the metal is relatively easily formed and forged, and it's, uh, it's not cheap. It doesn't bend. But at the same time, it isn't what? It isn't heavy. Or in the modern times today, you may pay hundreds of dollars for a jacket or for a pair of boots or for a hat or some gloves or a shirt, an athletic shirt, a workout shirt that has two main qualities. This jacket, this parka has two main qualities. It's warm. It's insulated, it's waterproof, it's water resistant, but at the same time, it's what? It's light. It's what? It's light. You can move around with it. You can still be nimble and athletic with it. But at the same time, it's going to keep you dry, it's going to keep you warm, and it's also what? Breathable. That's not going to be cheap. You're going to pay a good amount of money for a jacket like this or socks like that or boots like that. That are sturdy, but at the same time, what? Light. So that in itself is a novelty. And that in itself is an amazing feat. For something to keep its weight, to keep its strength, it's heavy, but at the same time, it's what? Easily carried around. So just stop and think about that now. How much that jacket will cost you hmm? in a sports store or online. Cost you a good amount of money. You're going to get what you pay for. And if you have a small, cheap price... Simple, basic, discounting price. In most cases, it's not what? It's not true, and it's claimed that this is state-of-the-art technology. Breathable, uh, waterproof, rainproof, but it's going to keep you warm. But at the same time, it's not a heavy, bulky jacket. Unless you get it for a steal, a good price. So the Prophet Sallam is telling you about a price. He's telling you about a discount. He's telling you about the easy, simple way of getting something that's light, and at the same time, what? Heavy. And last but not least is Habibatan. He says these two statements are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just think about this now. You're going to get this expensive jacket that's stylish. State-of-the-art protection. It's not heavy. It's not weighty. It doesn't bulk you down. It doesn't get soggy when it becomes wet. And it's at a what? A fraction. A, not even a fraction. No consideration of its original cost and value. Anybody's want to say, where's the jacket? No, nah, I want the jacket, even if I'm not going to be in the mountains, I'm not going to be in the woods, or I'm not a diver, or I'm not in this extreme uh, uh, situation as this person, but it's so cheap, it's so nice, it's so quality, why not get it? So the Prophet Sallam is telling us, if you make these two statements, Allah Azza will love them, and if Allah loves the statements, He'll love you by His permission, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not heavy. It doesn't take a lot of knowledge. It doesn't take a great deal of understanding. It doesn't take a great deal of mastery of the Arabic language to make these two statements. What are they? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, he says. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. And then you say, Subhanallah al azim This is a tremendous hadith. What is the secret? Why did Imam al Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala choose to make this the last hadith in his book? Why did he seal his book with this hadith? Khitam hu misk. The seal being musk. What's the secret behind that? First and foremost is, we get from this hadith, the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's bounty. And that Allah is kareem. He's generous. Allah is bar. And he's kareem. He's munificent to his slaves. He gives them so much. The things that he allows his slaves to do is so bountiful. How long did it take me to make that statement? Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanallah, adim. How long did it take? How many seconds was that, Ahmed? How many seconds did that take, Naeem? Subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, subhanallah, adim. How many seconds did that take? If that. And Allah Azza loves the statement. It's simple, easy. I can say it. And what most important is what? Thaqeelah 10. It's heavy on my scale of good deeds, so your scale of good deeds. So the first fa'id that we take from this hadith is the virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one can lose with Allah if he's sincere. 
There's no way that you can lose being a Muslim. There's no way that you can lose being a student of the Sunnah if you are sincere. The second fa'idah we take from this hadith is that Allah Azza wa Jal has love. Allah loves subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves things. Allah loves people. He loves actions. He loves times. He loves locations. He loves statements. And also we believe that Allah can be loved. His slaves, his servants, they love him subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah has told us in the Quran, a people who will love him, a people he will love. Allah loves those who fight in his cause. He loves those who are pure and clean. He loves those who make repentance. Allah, he loves and he is loved. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hmm? Allah loves and Allah is loved. The stronger believer, Al-Mu'minun Qawiyu Khayrun Wa Ahabu Illallahi Min Al-Mu'min al The stronger believer, the Prophet says, is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. So our aqidah, our creed as Muslims is that we love Allah and Allah also loves his servants. It goes both ways. Another fact that we take in this hadith is the affirmation of Allah's name, Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman. Allah's name is Ar-Rahman. It is well known to every Muslim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman. Surah Ar-Rahman in the Quran. However, this hadith teaches us Allah's name is Ar-Rahman. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and it also shows us that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ never clashes with the Qur'an. Rather, they go hand in hand. The hadith goes hand in hand with the Qur'an. The next fact that we give in this hadith, as we're going to read here, is the permissibility of rhyming. The permissibility of making a rhyme when you speak. As it says, Kalimatani, Habibatani ila rahman Khafifatani ala lisan Thaqilatani fil mizan you hear that? And, 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 and. That's rhythmic. That's rhythmic. So it shows it's permissible to say something and to rhyme. There's nothing wrong with saying something and rhyming. There's nothing wrong with saying something and it comes off in the style of a what? Of a rhyme. The Prophet was not a poet, as Allah has told us in the Quran. And it's unnecessary for someone to think or say that he was a poet. A poet. He was not a poet. We know that in Islam, poetry is permissible. And to make a rhyme when you speak is permissible. Giving a khutbah, making dua, it's permissible to have a rhyme, but there are conditions. And those conditions is that it shouldn't be something, as ulama say, that a person does going out of his way to sound good. Going out of your way to rhyme, going out of your way to sound eloquent, as many people do. They spend a great deal of time and effort and energy to go out of their way to sound in a certain manner. As far as if it flows off naturally, naturally smooth and eloquent, alhamdulillah. It's a good thing to get across to the people. Hmm? The people that like to hear eloquent things, smooth things. People love to hear what? Poetry, a legendary poem or a legendary poet. Also, uh, the ulama of Islam, as we're going to read, they say that this, po uh, this rhyming, this rhythmic style, it shouldn't be something that includes batil, falsehood. So anytime you're rhyming about something that isn't true, that's a lie, it's talking about uh, alcohol, women, this and that, then that's a different story. Then that's a different story. Another fact that we take from this hadith is the simplicity of the deeds in al-Islam. And also is that there is the affirmation of the mizan. That there is a scale in the hereafter. And the scale has a description. And the descriptions of those scales. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ خَفَّتْ ثَقُلَتْ Heavy and light. Heavy and light. Is that these scales, these deeds will become heavy and they'll be what? Light. And that was the intention of Imam al-Bukhari initially in this chapter. Because he quoted the Quran and he mentioned the scales of justice. And the hadith also affirms the what? Mizan. So let's ask ourselves the questions. What do we have in our mizans? How heavy is your scale? How much money you got in the bank? Say in the dunya. You poor. You're struggling. They say hungry. You're working every week like a slave just to pay your bills, just to, for this and for that. You live week by week. When are you going to save up money? When are you going to have some type of comfortable living? Son, go to school, get education, go to college. I don't want you to be this and to be that. I don't want you working in this department store. I want you to be in an office somewhere, in a high rise, a firm, making good money and not living week by week, struggling and scratching to survive. And then the people who do have good jobs or the people that have inherited wealth or whatever the case may be, 
what do they do among themselves? They fight, they argue, they connive, and they look down upon people and they envy people. Someone has millions of dollars in the bank is still not enough. I need more, I want more, and they attack each other. You can say yourself rich because you got millions of dollars? That's nothing. I had millions in the 80s, in the 70s. My family had millions. You're poor, you're nothing. I'm a multi-millionaire, I'm a billionaire. And they compete on how much money they have amassed and stacked up. This is the reality of human beings. So the Muslim, how many good deeds do you have stacked up? How much money have you saved all of the years you've been Muslim? That's very important, is to make sure that your scales are what? Not there, not, but what? Thaqila, heavy. It lumps down, bang. Everybody understand this? That's how you want your scales to be. And you want your bad deeds to be in the air, and the good deeds to be what? Lump on the floor, heavy. Thaqila. Everybody clear on this? So this is a reality that we all have to be mindful of. And the moment you wake up in the morning, the moment you go to sleep at night, think about heavy and light. Before I watch this, before I listen to this, before I drink this, before I smoke this, before I go with this one and that one, is it going to make my scales heavy or light? Which of the two? This is going to make my bad deeds heavy and my good deeds light. When you seek in, when you go to the masjid for fajr, and the list goes on. This should be a constant thought of every Muslim. Good and what? And light. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajr, rahim Allah ta'ala, he says regarding this hadith, we're reading from uh, volume 13 of Fatah al-Dari, page 540. Qawluhu, uh, he says here, oh, before we even go that far, he says here, wa khussa لفظ الرحمن بالذكر لأن المقصود من الحديث بيان سعة رحمة الله تعالى على عباده حيث يجازي على العمل القليل بالثواب الكثير. He says the reason why Allah's name Al Rahman was mentioned in this hadith, why the Prophet mentioned Al Rahman, is to show something, and that is to inform the people that Allah's mercy is so vast, so expansive. Why does he give such a great reward for such a small, simple statement? That's why he says, Habibatani ila Rahman. And he didn't say, Habibatani ila Allah. Beloved to Ar Rahman. Showing you that Allah's mercy is greater than you can ever think and imagine. Because he gives you such a great, tremendous reward for such a simple, basic deed. And before we move forward, reading the Kalam of Hafiz al Hajar, Allah, it also shows us a refutation of the different Muslims who make things hard upon themselves. And they say that you can't get to Allah unless you punish yourself. You can't get to Allah unless you torture yourself. You can't get to Allah until you sacrifice and give up everything, all of this to make dhikr. Then you can get to Allah. That's incorrect. Here's a simple, basic supplication. And the Prophet informs us it's heavy. And it didn't take a lot of effort. And it didn't take any burden from you whatsoever. So you don't have to spin around in a circle and sing and dance. You don't have to say, Allah, 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 who, 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 who. That's incorrect. That's wrong. That you have to sit and make dhikr for an hour for Allah to forgive you of your sins. That's not right. That's incorrect. If you wish to make dhikr for, to Allah Azawajal for a long time, that's a good thing. But the concept of innovating, making something up, and then saying that this is the only way that you can make dhikr. And Jannah isn't cheap, brother. It's not cheap. You can't just get it by saying, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. That's not absolutely right. So the best dhikr to make is the dhikr of the Prophet, Sallallahu And this also goes to show us the spirituality of Islam and of the Sunnah. And Sayyid Bukhari is a book of spirituality. It's not just a book of technical things and names, Haddathana, Akhbarana. But it's also a book of the Ruh, of the Spirit. Khairin, inshallah. Al-Hafidh ibn Hajr, rahimahullah ta'ala, he then says, Qawluhu, khafifatani ala lisan, thaqilatani fil mizan, wasafahuma bil khifati wa thiqili biyani qilat al-amal, wa kathrat al-thawabi, wa fi hadhi al-alfadhi thalatha, sajun musta'adabun, wa qad taqadama fi al-da'awati biyani al-jayazi min, wa al-manhi an, wa katha fi al-hudud, fi hadithi saja' ka saja' al-kuhani, wa al-hasil an al-manhi anhu ma kana mutakallafan aw mutadamminan li batilin, la ma jaa afwan min ghayri qasdin ilayh. As we've explained about rhyming and the permissibility of rhyming, as long as it isn't something that you go out of your way to do, as long as it isn't something that includes falsehood and vice. Also, when the Prophet ﷺ describes the scales of being light and heavy, 
He says it shows us the abundance of good deed, the abundance of thawab, the abundance of the reward uh, based off of a simple action, as we previously stated. Ibn Hajar, he says, this shows that it's permissible as well to rhyme as long as it isn't something which is done out of going out of your way and including falsehood, as we've previously explained in Sahih al-Bukhari. He then says here, فقال لأن الحسنة حضرت مرارتها وغابت حلاوتها فثقلت فلا يحملنك ثقل على تركها والسيئة حضرت حلاوتها وغابت مرارتها فلذلك خفت فلا يحملنك خفة على ارتكابها He then says um, that the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام when he said كلمتان he called these two statements words a كلمة he said when you take your شهادة كلمة not كلمة كلمة when you say La ilaha illallah, and the word kalima is translated to mean a word, but in actuality it isn't a word, it's an actual sentence. But he called it a kalima because it's so simple, so small, and so sweet. So simple, so small, and sweet. So a sentence is called a word because of what? Just like that. Everybody understand this? It's just like that. Uh, he then says here, uh, and the Prophet is speaking about lightness. Carrying heavy bags, carrying something, working, laboring, all right, back breaking labor. You have to bend over. Like in Sanatullah, Alhamdulillah, you have, to, you have to hurt yourself. You sweat, your back hurts when you pick something up and you walk and you bear it. He says, but this is something that's heavy but doesn't hurt your back whatsoever. Now, and he says here, uh, when some of the Salaf, they were asked the question, why is the good deed heavy and the bad deed light? Why is the good deed heavy and why is the bad deed light? He said, the good deed is something that the sweetness of is absent. It's not there yet. You can't see the true benefit of the good deed. But the hardship, the initial hardship and the weight of it is there. Getting up to make salat, spending the money, paying zakat, going to make hajj. It's a hardship. The hardship is present. And the sweetness isn't necessarily always what? Present. And the sayyah, the sin, is the exact what? Opposite. It's sweet. It feels good. It's fun. It's nice now. But the hardship, the consequence is something that's what? You, don't, you can't see yet. Like drinking alcohol. You drink. You get happy. feel fun. You have fun. You laugh. You joke. You do this and you do that. But the consequence of it is what? That comes and invites you later on. So this, these prize predecessors, they said, if this is the case, because the hasana is a bit heavy in the beginning, don't leave it off. And because the sayyah is a bit sweet in the beginning, easy in the beginning, don't what? Don't perform it. Let's think about that wisdom. The whole entire concept of drug abuse in America is say drugs kill. Don't do drugs. Say no to drugs. That's easy for you to say. You didn't try the drug. You don't know what it's like to be intoxicated. You don't know what it's like to have just one taste and tap of this drug. So how are you going to tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing and judge me? You don't know what it's like. This is a mentality. It feels so good. The intoxication is so nice in the beginning. But then after the intoxication must come a world of misery and pain. A world of misery and what? And pain. And that is obviously for the user and also the one who provides the drugs, the smallest street peddler, to the actual government official who brings the drugs into the country. Everybody. Because when you're getting caught in that scandal, it's not going to be sweet anymore. When you go from riches to life in prison, 20 years in prison, 10 years in prison, it's not what? Sweet. It's not sweet anymore. When you go from I can control it, I can stop when I want to stop. And then your family is lost. Your life is lost. Your career is gone. It's not what? 
sweet. It's not sweet anymore. So just look at that tremendous wisdom. So you tell yourself, you tell your children, it may feel good, son. It may look razzling and dazzling. It may look nice. But trust me, it's going to what? Misery is going to come. As they said, after the laughter comes what? Come tears. So that's Allah. So Jalla to allow us to reflect on this hadith and to implement it and practice it in our daily lives. Brothers and sisters, please, inshallah, I'm asking you personally, personal favor, to make sure, make it your duty. Every Muslim, and maybe non Muslims that you come across, share this hadith with them today. This is what I learned. Share it with them. Go home, go to Sahih Bukhari, read it in English translation, put your mark, your highlighter, and pass it and spread it to everybody that you come across. Whether you heard of the hadith before or not, make this a tweet, an email, a text message, a WhatsApp, and share it with the Muslims and also with the non Muslims. You go to the supermarket, you meet someone, you tell them, this is what our Prophet says. Perhaps it will be a means of inspiring them to accept Islam. Allah surely knows best. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.